Hatima Tova. Tonight is the holiest night of the year. It's the one night we wear a talit, a prayer shawl, don white as a sign of purity, and begin our fast. It's also a night we stand in front of an empty ark. Normally, the Aron, the holy ark, is filled with Sifre Torah. But without Torahs, the Aron's meaning changes. In Hebrew, Aron is ark, but it is also casket. Looking into an empty ark devoid of Torah scrolls is as if we're peering into our own coffins, staring at our mortality. We're reminded of the high priest who once a year on Yom Kippur Day entered the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the secret ark at the center of the temple in Jerusalem to ask for forgiveness on behalf of the entire Israelite community. This holy ark was such an awesome place that before the high priest entered, a rope was tied around his leg so that when he was inside, if something terrible happened, he could be quickly pulled out to safety. As we stare at our empty ark, our coffin, imagine a rope tied to each of our legs. Imagine that rope pulling you back to reality, tugging at your soul, urging you to tune out what's unimportant in life, all those senseless distractions we get caught up with and refocus on what's essential. We live during uncertain and unsettling times. It seems we never know what tomorrow will bring. Yet that rope is tugging on our ankles reminding us there's no more waiting. Change is about right now. Forgiveness is right now. An open heart is right now. Kol Nidre cries to us, who do you want to be this year? How do you want to be this year? What is your purpose this next year? Friends, we're staring at our mortality. Gaze deeply.
We stand humble before you, 
In this time of tumult, there is so much to be afraid of, so much to tremble before. Our hearts ache for our own selves, for our congregation, for our city, for our country, for our world. We have grown weary of fear. What merit do any of us have to stand before you as we look around us and see the pain and destruction of the human race is wrought, we ask, are any of us worthy? In our prayers, in our tshuva, we seek to be worthy. And so we pray. Turn our fear into resolve, our trembling into groundedness, our grief into action. O oh, Holy One of Being, remind us tonight that we are loved, that we are cared for, that we're not alone, that we all have merit. We might be dust and ashes, but the world was created for us. And tonight we accept our obligation to care for it and fix it, for you animate us. And we stand before you reflected in the eyes of one another in deep humility and in prayer. These next 24 hours of introspection are a gift. We strike a match to bring life, light into darkness, hope into uncertainty, opportunity into chaos. As we light the yunt of candles, take a moment to focus on the light you'd like to bring into our world. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kirishanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'had Likner L'had Likner Shel Yom Tov it's interesting that no one knows where Mount Sinai is, but we do know the mountain where the temple was built in Jerusalem. Why is that? Maybe because where we receive something is not as important as where we build something. As we rise for Baruch Hu, focus on what you've built this past year even in our homes, even in silence, even in solitude. It's what we build that makes who we are. We rise for Baruch Hu, page 127. <laughs>
be seated. We have been in such dark, narrow places. We have felt fear where no words could comfort us. We seemed lost, and yet, through your compassion and loving kindness, God, we are here now. Blessed are you, guardian of all, who carries us to safety, then, now, and always. Micha Mocha, page 128. you now to rise for the Amidah, page 131.
We continue silently until page 136. As we recite the words of Vidui, our communal confessional prayer, we're taught that we should beat our chest with each confession in order to demonstrate our remorse for each sin. However, it's also been suggested that we ought to show ourselves mercy by massaging our hearts, allowing for the pain to heal and room for us to learn and grow from our mistakes. Page 138. Please join me on page 138. We have all committed offenses. Together we confess these human sins, the sins of arrogance, bigotry, and cynicism, of deceit and egotism, flattery and greed, hatred, injustice, and jealousy. Some of us kept grudges, were lustful, malicious, and narrow-minded. Others were obstinate, possessive, quarrelsome, rancorous, or selfish. We callously used others. There was violence, weakness of will, xenophobia. We yielded to temptation and showed zeal for bad causes. For all of them, God of forgiveness, please forgive us, pardon us, help us atone. Oh, <laughs> 
Please be seated. Albert Einstein and the Swiss Italian engineer Michele Besso were friends for over 60 years. In 1955, when Einstein learned of his close friend's passing, he wrote a letter to Michele's sister. At the time, Einstein had a sense that his own death was also impending. And perhaps because of this, his mood had turned toward the ultimate and meaning when he wrote Michele's sister the following. Now Michele has departed this strange world a little ahead of me. That signifies nothing. For us believing physicists, the distinction between past and present and future 
is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Einstein died a little over a month later. In his letter, Einstein speaks about past, present, and future. He speaks about life, death, and the interplay between. These are important words for us in these first moments of Yom Kippur. For we too ask, what is time? As seasons pass, months bleed into months, days meld into days, and hours into hours in this time of pandemic. And tonight, we too, all at once, reflect on our past year, allow our awareness of the present to settle in, and press our thoughts to future change. Some of you have heard me share that I have been waking during the night to the sounds of screaming. I thought for a while it would stop, but it hasn't or it won't. At first, I imagined the screams were coming from my children, calling me out of the dark of their rooms. I even skinned up my knee, rug burns up and down my leg as I jump from my bed one night, tripping, running, stumbling, still not awake to reach my kids' room only to find them peacefully quiet in their beds, breathing softly just as they ought to have been. The screams I have worked out are not dreams. They are the desperate, panic-inducing screams of the world's unrest. They are the piercing, true call of the shofar, the still, small voice of the universe, no longer still in small, rather disturbed and raging at the state of her creation. I know these screams to be the collective soul crying out that the restful night of sleep, which once allowed us to lie comfortably in our beds, well-resourced and privileged, well, that, that was the dream. And it is time for us to wake up from it. This is a sermon about unrest. When I finish speaking and you wonder, what is she trying to say? This is what I hope you might remember. We are in a time of collective, political, environmental, economic, human, and civil unrest. These realities have led to widespread experience of physical unrest. In our time, every day is Yom Kippur, a day of reckoning. Unrest is uncomfortable. It can be painful and disorienting and dangerous and destabilizing. It can also be exciting and forward-looking. It is jumping out of our chair with a new idea. It is letting things blow up so they can be built again. It is imagination and wild energy and change. Being in a state of unrest means being alive and not being done. I heard an interview recently with a mother who was detained in an immigration center in Dilly, Texas with her eight-year-old son 
She explained how she tried to keep him asleep for as much of the day as possible, like until 10 or 11 a.m., just so he wouldn't have to be awake that long. That way, she said, his day would be shorter and would go by faster. This mom kept her boy asleep to protect him from his harsh new reality from the torture of being awake. It was a mother's desperate act to protect her son and offer him some kind of escape. But to be kept asleep is an unnatural state. It is a coping mechanism to deal with the unbearable. It is imposing a state of inertia and shutting out the world. Unrest, I suggest, is the state of being that holds the greatest possibility of potential. There is the passive unrest that keeps us up at night and keeps our stomachs churning with worry. But there is also the willful unrest, which inspires us to get up, to know we're not done, to know that the world needs us, our loved ones need us, and we need ourselves. Being human means being mortal, but it is only our secular society that tells us that life is a linear path from birth to death. Our Jewish tradition teaches that each new year propels us into a new cycle. That is the great spiral of existence on Kol Nidre. Tonight, we are taught that we rehearse our death. We do this because this death, it leads to rebirth. We are in a time of great unrest and great potential. How will we choose to move through it? What will come of it as for us as individuals, for our community? and our nation, and our world. Torah is a book of unrest, and it was received when our ancestors were in a state of unrest. Torah teaches that the foundations of the universe were laid through God's restlessness, a divine unwillingness to allow the status quo to continue. Out of nothingness, we are taught God contracted to make space for creation. It was all chaos and void, Torah said, until it wasn't. No sooner did God create the world than the first human beings grew tired of their ordered existence, defied its boundaries, and were expelled from Eden. And from their unrest, a complicated, beautiful, creative humanity was born. Torah teaches us that our purpose is to create, evolve, imagine, work, change, grow, dismantle, rebuild, and live, and then do it all again and again to be awake and to leave a better world for the next generation. We are a restless people bound together by a restless book, and it is this book we teach our children in our actions and in our words. So my kids, like all kids, ask a lot of questions. This means, as one of their parents, I have to know things. For the most part, it turns out I know nothing. So I'm looking things up a lot. Facts about plants and planets and bugs and trees and flowers, animals, and the very air around us. What's that? They asked last spring of a giant shrub by the side of a trail in Griffith Park. And what are those? They asked of the giant spiky fruit growing on it. I had never seen the plant before. I had never even noticed it, but I was ready for this one because earlier, TIOH member Darcy Weber had told me which plant books I needed to buy in order to start answering these kinds of questions. 
I consulted the book. It's a wild cucumber, I told them with authority. A few weeks later, like a page out of Jonah, we walked by again, and the shrub was shriveling and brown. Why did it change, they asked me. That was a much, much harder question to answer. Why does anything change? It died, I said gently. How, they asked with wonder. How did it die? How, indeed. I'm not a doctor. But I've been present with a number of people as they have approached their deaths. These have been some of the most sacred, profound, and sad moments of my life. We say of the dead, rest in peace, but there is a period of unrest, often that occurs just before we take our last breath, which hospice and palliative care professionals call active dying. When someone begins a process of actively dying, so much of their essence begins to change, the way they hold their body, the cadence of their breath, the tone of their skin, the beat of their heart, their sounds and smells, their gaze, even their body temperature. If tonight is a night for us to confront our own mortality and the nature of things, it's also a time for willful unrest, a time for us to allow ourselves, even coax ourselves into feeling, into sensing, into being in a state of change and transition. Tonight, we choose to be awake, to open our eyes, alter our breath, and carefully form the words our mouths speak to quiet our thinking and patterns of consumption enough to rouse ourselves to that which is trying to merge within and around us. To realize our own mortality is to inspire urgency and purpose, not dread or nihilistic futility. The poet Rilke wrote, you neighbor God, if sometimes in the night I rouse you with loud knocking, I do so only because I seldom hear you breathe. So many of us long to feel the pulsating steady breath of the universe that animates us and reminds us that we're connected to each other and to all things seen and unseen. That is the knocking in the night. It's the sound of us confronting the ultimate and willing ourselves to feel the wonder and the possibility of life. When people draw their last breath, the sound is called a death rattle. Once you hear it, you don't forget it. It is the sound of ultimate unrest. It is the shofar's call of trua. We are rehearsing our death tonight, tradition teaches, because we know that it is time for some things to end. We feel that in our very being. We know these sorts of things, not first in our minds, but first in our kishkas. And this is a time. Friends, this is a time when beliefs, institutions, patterns, assumptions, histories, myths, and yes, people. God, so many people are dying all around us. We rehearse our death tonight so that we might hear the death rattle feel the unrest, and be a part of helping something new to emerge. The next 24 hours are about changing big things. They're about us being active parts of that change, of setting our attentions anew, 
of stopping and noticing and welcoming the unrest and discomfort. Wild cucumbers, it turns out, are a part of a family of plants called ephemerals. Ephemerals grow quickly in the spring. They flower, produce their tiny, spiny fruits, and then wither away, ready to inspire new life and a new season with new fruit. We are all ephemerals, are we not? And tonight begins a collective process for all of us, ushering us beyond the threshold so that we might spring back to life and bear new fruit. This is the divine unrest of creation, and we embody it tonight. Like the progressive sound of the shofar from Tekia to Trua and back again, that we, too, might start anew. Einstein wrote of his friend, now he has departed this strange world a little ahead of me. That signifies nothing for us believing physicists. The distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Tonight, I pray, we might all be believing physicists for we can only change our future if we are awake enough in our present to confront our lives with a sense of urgency. Tonight is a night to reimagine our presence so that we might create future life and we might bring into being the world we want to inhabit. Tonight is a final rehearsal. It is also a new beginning, a night to be born and reborn and reborn again. Gamar Khatimatova. who touched our lives, whose light still shines brightly in our hearts, whose lessons inspire us, whose words stay with us, whose memories we cherish. In your home, please rise now and say aloud the names of the loved ones you carry with you tonight. We hold them so close to our hearts, and now, for all of us not standing, will you please rise in solidarity with those who are mourning and remembering and to honor all those who do not have anyone left to say Kaddish for them. God, who is love, we praise your name. Page 151, Kaddish Yatom. Yikadal v'yikadash shemei rabah, be'alma divrach yiratei v'yam lich machutei, b'chayechon v'yomechon v'chayei d'chol b'yit Yisrael, v'agala v'zman ka'ari v'imru, amen. Yehei shemei rabah mevrach le'olam olamei olmaya, Yit barach, viet tabach, viet paar, viet ramam, viet nase, viet tadar, viet tale, viet tala, shame de kudisha berichu. La ela, ula ela, mi kol berchata, vashirata, tushpachata, venechamata, dami ranbel, ma vim ru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya. 
v'chayim alenu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imru amen. O se shalom b'mromav, hu ya'ase shalom, alenu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imru amen. Now, if you will, from your homes, raise up your hands in the sign of the priestly benediction and join with us in these ancient words of blessing and meaning. Ve asem lecha shalom, ken yehi ratzon. May you walk through this world feeling whole. May you walk through this world feeling loved. May you walk through this world knowing that God shines in you and on you and through you, and that you carry in you the blessing and mark of shalom. And we say together, amen some words of gratitude. First, the deepest gratitude to Roger Cumble, Anima Vafi, and James Schmidt for creating these sacred holiday experiences for our community. Thank you to Rabbi Greenenbaum, Bill Spall, Roberta Berendt, and our entire dedicated temple staff, and all the volunteers who work so hard to make these holidays meaningful. Thank you to our temple president, Heidi Siegel, and our board of trustees for their leadership and for tomorrow. Join us for a full day of programming for Yom Kippur starting at 1 p.m. with learning, yoga, spiritual journeys, a musical meditation with Shelley Fox and Michael Alfera, the Book of Jonah radio show, and our digital Book of Remembrance. Yisker will be at 5 p.m. Ni'ila will be at 5.30 p.m. Please bring your shofar and the Havdalah candle you received in your holiday package from the temple. We would like to thank all the staff at Hillside Memorial Park and Mortuary. And finally, please join us on Zoom on Monday, October 5th at 7 p.m. for TIOH's Voting Symposium, when a panel of experts and ju social justice leaders will talk us through all the propositions on the November ballot and suggest how we might all cast a just ballot. And now, Shelley, for our closing song. Oh,